Hi everybody and welcome to our presentation today on the EU GDPR or the General Data Protection Regulation and today's talk is going to be what is GDPR and why should I care? So some of you may know who I am already but just in case you don't I'll give you some background on who I am and what so uh, I'm Brian Honan, and I'm CEO of BH Consulting, which is an independent security firm based in Dublin, Ireland. I also run iResearch, which is Ireland's first computer emergency response team. I'm a special advisor on uh, cybercrime and internet security to Europol's Centre for Cybercrime based out of The Hague. Uh, I lecture in information security management at the University College of Dublin and I provide expert advice to ENISA, the European Network Information Security Agency, uh, on various topics on security and I regularly comment on media stories regarding security as well. So uh, that's who I am and hopefully I can share some of that knowledge with you, you guys here today. So it doesn't take us a, a, a lot to look around and see that data, especially personal data, is fast becoming the new oil of the 21st century. It is what lots of companies thrive on, it's what uh, uh, services rely on, and it's how we, we ourselves interact and communicate with, with each other. So uh, it is the new oil. It can be uh, a great resource for companies to have and to do it. But data, just like oil, can also cause a lot of damage if it's not handled correctly, correctly or it leaks. It can be quite toxic if it falls into the wrong hands or it goes to the wrong areas or it's misused or abused in some way, shapes or form. So it is quite important that we protect this new oil, we protect this data to ensure that it's used properly and, and securely. The other threat facing data is the whole uh, area of cybercrime and where organized criminals and gangs are looking to get personal data to exploit it. And uh, this gentleman here on the screen now is uh, the infamous bank robber from the 1930s, uh, Willie Sutton. And upon his arrest, he was allegedly asked by a news reporter, hey, Willie, why do you rob banks? And he replied, because that's where the money is. So I think today's uh, Willie Sutton, or Cyber Willie Sutton, as I've named him there, will be asked a similar question, will be why do you hack, hack companies? Because that's where the data is. So data is recognized by criminals as having a, a value to it, and that ranges from financial data, banking details, to credit card details, to actually our own personal information as well, like um, our names, addresses, mother's maiden names, families, etc., our health data, that all has significant value on the uh, criminal undergrounds and has been sold uh, and bought a, a lot. So it, it, it is attracting criminals to target companies of all shapes and sizes. So it's important to remember, you may be a small company, but you do process data and that will make you a target for criminals. It also means you have to ensure that you're protecting that data properly as well. So with that in mind, the EU has now come out with its new data protection framework, which is called the EU GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. And it's an update to the existing data protection directive, which focuses on the information of the individuals and how companies should secure the information that is entrusted to them by those individuals. And that's a significant thing to consider, is that within EU law, personal information is held and owned by the individual, not by the corporations or the business that gather the information, but by the individuals. And they entrust the information to the organizations, and those organizations are therefore obliged to protect it in certain ways. So. GDPR is an update to the Data Protection Directive to bring it in line with the 21st century and to ensure that focus on the individual is there. Uh, it has come into force since May 24, 2016, so that's when it's, it's been published. Uh, there is a two-year period of grace until all member states in the EU have to have this up as part of their regulations. So from the 25th of May 2018, GDPR will be in effect across all EU member states. It will be the law in every single one of those countries. And 25th May 2018 may sound like a long way away, but at the time of this recording, 
it's just only 15 months away. So 15 months is not a, a long time to get a major project in place and up and running. So it's important to, to be aware of what GDPR uh, is bringing and how you should uh, deal with it. So some of the key things to uh, remember when it comes to GDPR or to be aware of is that firstly, this is a major update to the EU data protection uh, directive with a strong focus on the individual's privacy rights. So the, the focus has come down to the individual and how our data should be protected and secured. It now harmonizes the data protection regime across all 28 EU member states. Under the current regime, each EU member state has to bring the data protection regulation, uh, data protection framework into its own laws, and each country has done that in slightly different ways. So it has led to a, if you like, a patchwork of, uh, of different rules and regulations throughout the EU. Uh, with GDPR, it'll be the same and consistent across all nations. It will apply to all uh, countries uh, in the EU, currently 28 EU member states, and there will be significant fines and obligations on organizations that hold personal data, and we'll talk about those fines uh, in a few more slides. So as mentioned, GDPR focuses on personal data. Uh, and personal data means any information relating to an identified natural person. Uh, so that in plain terms means any lived individual, any piece of information that a controller, a data controller or a company can access or collate or process in any way, shape or form that can identify either by itself or with other pieces of information an individual will be uh, subject to GDPR. So companies need to be aware of what type of information they have on individuals, where the information is, and what type of information they have. So that can be anything from user IDs to uh, membership numbers to financial details, names, addresses, uh, etc. So any information you can build up a profile of an individual that will be subject to GDPR. And EU GDPR applies to all EU member states. So all 28 member states that are currently part of the European Union have to ensure that GDPR is part of their uh, legal framework come May 2018. And that does include those of you who are based in the United Kingdom, uh, despite Brexit, which will uh, probably happen after May 2018, uh, given the amount of time those negotiations will, t will take place, uh, GDPR will apply. So within the UK, you are still going to have to be prepared and to work uh, towards uh, complying with GDPR uh, for May the 25th in 2018. Also, quite significantly, EU GDPR also applies to any companies outside of the EU who wish to deal or, or process personal data belonging to EU uh, citizens. Uh, so this means if, if your company is based in the US or in China or Asia or uh, South America or any other countries outside of the EU member states and you're providing services and you're processing personal information, you also have to comply with EU GDPR. Now, a lot of people ask me, well, I, if we're not based in the EU, how can that be enforced? And how, there is a lot of logic behind that. That you know, is the European courts or are the European courts going to come after somebody based in South America because they didn't uh, adhere to uh, GDPR uh, requirements? Uh, the other flip coin of that is, uh, if you ever do want to set up your business in the EU and don't forget the EU is the second biggest trading bloc in uh, the world, the second biggest market in the world. So you may want to set up a regional office or a European office at some stage in your company's development within the EU. So it is important to ensure you have a clean slate, if you like, uh, before, before you come in. So uh, it will be good practice and it probably will be uh, ethically good to show that you do follow the principles of GDPR for your business anyway, uh, regardless of whether you're going to be located in the EU. But if you do process information of EU citizens, you do have to comply with GDPR as well. So what does GDPR mean to the individual? What does it mean to people like myself who, who live in the EU uh, and other people in the EU who, who 
who give their information to government bodies, to commercial companies, uh, etc., on a daily basis. Well, the first right to you, it gives you a number of rights. The first one is the right to be informed. So I, I, have, I have the right to ensure that wh- whoever I give my information to, they have to inform me what the information, how the information is going to be used. I have the right to access that information, so I can s- uh, s- submit a uh, subject access request. Um, to a company and request from them all copies of information uh, that they hold about about me. If I feel the information they have about me is incorrect, I have the right to ensure that the company corrects that information and makes the information accurate and up to date. Uh, I also have the right to erasure if if I stop using the service of a company or I move off elsewhere or I feel the company uh, should not have my information, I have the right to ensure my information is deleted from that company. So that's known as well as the right to be forgotten, uh, but that is the, the, uh, an important right that people have as well. I also have the right to restrict processing of information. Uh, if I feel uh, the automated processing of my information leaves me at a disadvantage, I can request that that information be processed in a manual way instead. Uh, so, for example, if I'm applying for a bank loan or uh, credit uh, from some institution and it's going through that organization's uh, financial algorithms and I feel I haven't been dealt fairly, I can request for a, a manual uh, review of that process as well. Uh, I have the right to data portability, that I can move my information from one provider to another. I have the right to object as to how my information is being used. I can uh, stop it being, being used as well. And I can have a right in relation to automate decision making and profiling so I can ensure that my information is not abused or misused in any way by organizations in their own internal uh, automation process. So what does this mean for organizations? Well, with GTB organizations now have to get clear consent before they can uh, gather and pro- store and process any information of individuals. So you, we have to ensure that when we gather information from, com- from individuals that we give good, clear, concise information as to what the information is going to be used for. If the data subject is under 16, we have to make sure we get parental consent as well. Uh, if an individual requests the, a copy of the information, we are legally obliged to provide the information uh, to that individual within a certain time frame. So there's no get out clause there as well. Again, if we are requested to raise all inf- information of an individual, we have to do so if requested. Uh, we also have to ensure that any information we gather of individuals has adequate security. Now, that's a very loose term. What does adequate security mean? Well, basically it means that we have to ensure that based on the sensitivity information that we hold on somebody, that we put proper security controls in place to protect the information. So somebody's name and address would not be deemed to be as sensitive maybe as their health information or their financial records. So therefore, we would expect greater protections to be put in place around information such as financial information or health records uh, that may be other nonsense information. So it's making sure that adequate security is in place and that takes into account the technology available at the time. Uh, So, you know, 20 years ago, it may have been deemed to be technically quite challenging to encrypt all laptops and mobile devices. Nowadays, that shouldn't be as as challenging and it wouldn't be seen as an excuse by any uh, uh, supervisory body that you didn't encrypt that data. If you're going to deliver a new service uh, that process information or you're going to develop a new application or a new system, you will have to do a privacy impact assessment to determine what potentially could go wrong or what could happen if there's a security breach on this individual's information or how could their privacy be impacted by the way you process the information as well. So that's an important thing to, to be done. That has to be done at the very start of every of those, project, uh, of those projects. The good news is, as I mentioned earlier on, with the current data protection uh, regime, it's, a, it's like a quilt work patch, it's a patchwork of uh, laws throughout Europe that companies have to be aware of as they operate in different countries. But now you can have one supervisory authority to deal with and it's, it, you don't have to deal with 
28 supervisory authorities. You can just pick one in one country and deal with them. And you can select your preferred uh, supervisory authority as well. So you could have your company based in France and you could pick the supervisory authority in Germany or the UK or Italy or in Ireland, depending on where you think your pro your business is going to be uh, most beneficial and which supervisory authority will be the best one to deal with. You can pick which one is uh, most relevant to you. A major change with uh, GDPR is now mandatory breach detection. So within 72 hours of discovering a breach of personal security information, we have to ensure that the supervisory authority is notified within 72 hours of the company becoming aware of the breach. And if it's a high risk breach where it could impact on an individual's rights and freedoms of those individuals, so potentially, you know, sense of financial information, etc., those people must be uh, notified directly as well. So that's a big change in uh, European law. Up until now, there's been very limited uh, mandatory breach report, uh, reporting requirements, but now this is going to apply to all personal data and any potential breaches to that as well. So it's a, it's a significant change and companies need to be prepared for that. So when you're informing the supervisory authority about the breach, the the information you have to provide includes the nature of the personal data breach, including the cash and the approximate number of the individuals impacted, and also maybe the, 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 the number of personal data records concerned. So an individual may have a number of different records. So it's the individuals and the number of records that you have to be uh, aware of. You have to provide contact details of your data protection officer or another uh, member of the company that can act as a contact point for the supervisory authority to deal with. Uh, description of the likely consequences of the, of the breach. So what could that breach have, what the impact could be on the individuals? And then what measures you've taken or will take to deal with the breach and what you will take to, to make sure there will be no adverse uh, effects on the individuals as well. So there's a, quite a lot of things to consider there for, for informing the uh, supervisory authority and uh, companies need to have good incident response plans in place and good procedures in place for how they're going to, to, to deal with such type of breaches. Another big change is the requirement to appoint a data protection officer. So if you're a company that, uh, you know, if your organization is a public authority, and there are some exceptions to, to these rules whereby you, if it's in the judicial or uh, legal uh, law enforcement or defenses and security services, then you may be exempt from, from, from these. Uh, but other companies that deal with large-scale systematic monitoring of, of individuals and, and processing of, of individuals' information, uh, or if you deal with processing of special categories of information, or if you deal with information relating to criminal convictions and offences, you must appoint a data protection officer. So this is becoming a mandatory requirement now that most companies will have to have a, a, a data protection officer, somebody who is of a senior enough rank that they can report into the highest management level of the organization, be that the board or senior management, somebody who can operate independently of the rest of the organization. So uh, they're not constrained or uh, hindered by their, their existing reporting lines that once they, they are the data protection officer, they are deemed to be independent that they cannot be dismissed or penalized for performing their tasks. So if a data protection officer uh, insists on certain things happening to ensure GTPR is enforced in the organization, that the organization can't simply get rid of that data protection officer for doing that and replace them with somebody else. That person, the data protection officer, is does have certain uh, protections as well. And the company has to be seen to be given adequate resources as well to the data protection officer, be that in uh, staffing, budgeting, training, etc. Uh, it's to make sure that the DPO can do their job uh, properly. Another key difference uh, and enhancement with GTPR is that uh, the supervisory authority can now directly fine companies for breaches of uh, data protection rules. Uh, in many current uh, 
legislation in, in, in different EU member states, it's down to the supervisory authority bringing a company or organisation to court and the court then deciding what the, the, the fine should be. Now the supervisory authorities can fine directly. Uh, the headline figures to think about is that those fines can be up to 20 million euro or 4% of the company's annual global turnover, whichever is, is the greatest, and that would be for their, the more serious infringements. Uh, if you fail to notify uh, the supervisory authority about a security breach, you can f- face a fine up to 10 million euros or 2% of your global turnover, and that could be on top of the fine for the breach itself. So the data protection uh, supervisory authority could fine you for, the, for having the breach and then fine you again for not informing them about the breach. Also, individuals have rights. So we, as an individual, uh, you can complain to the supervisory authority about how your information has been uh, uh, processed or mishandled or abused. You have the right to compensation, so you can, you as an individual, you can sue an organisation. And you, there's also potential there for uh, group actions for uh, class action uh, suits can be taken against companies for major security breaches. So May the 25th, 2018 is the big date that companies need to have marked in their calendars for, with regards to GDPR. I think it's significant to see that a, a report from Trend Micro showed that in a survey they, they, they ran that 50% of UK IT, IT decision makers weren't even aware of GDPR, which I think is, is, is a scary thing to have the companies uh, surveyed didn't even know GDPR was on, on the way. And 25% were adamant that they would not be compliant with GTBR by May 25th, 2018. This is why, to reiterate what we said earlier on, it is important to start planning and putting things in place for GTBR today. So my apologies for the earworm. No doubt this song is going to give into people's ears, but Europe's final countdown has started. May the 25th, 2018 is the, the, the big date. And for those of you of a certain age, yes, that is how your managers uh, did dress and look back in the 80s with the big hair. Uh, not not nice, nice, neat and prim that they might look at <laughs> like they do today. But yes, the final countdown is on, so we need to be prepared for it. So to make sure you're prepared for GDPR and that you have your, st- your process in place, I think the first thing you need to do is identify your key data assets. What information, what personal information does your organization hold on individuals, be that on customers, on suppliers, or on staff? Wh- what information do you have? What type of information is it? And where is it stored? Uh, so that's important to know where all the information is and how much of it you, you have. Once you've identified the information, it is important to make sure you do a proper risk assessment against that information to ensure you've identified all the risks. And this is an important task to do because without doing this step, it's going to be very hard for you to prove to the DPO or your internal audit or indeed to the supervisory authority that you've taken adequate security uh, uh, to protect that personal information. Because without a risk assessment, how do you know what what, what is adequate or not? So uh, this is a key step to ensuring you identify the risks. And if the risk is too great, maybe you avoid it or you look at ways to reduce the risk by putting more technological controls in place or processes or training, or you transfer it, maybe you outsource the task to a company that is better suited to do it uh, instead of you. Once you've done your risk assessment, it's important to make sure you've identified and establish your data protection policies and related security policies as well. Uh, Having documented policies is critically important because it sets the tone for the organization as to how it's going to deal with data protection. It gives guidance to staff and everybody else and what they need to do to ensure that they are uh, compliant and working against uh, the data protection uh, requirements. So having your policies is a, a critical step in achieving compliance with GTPR. And there's no need to worry about, well, where do I start or uh, how do I begin this process? There, there are some very good frameworks out there already that can be be used quite effectively to ensure compliance with GDPR. You can you can use uh, ISO 27001 uh, 2013 Information Security Standard and the guidance document ISO 27002 that supports the, the standard. Uh, you can look at ways to either get certified to the standard or even simply 
be compliant to the standard to ensure that you, you meet the requirements of GDPR. You can also uh, use the NIST cybersecurity framework uh, to make sure that uh, you, you have the right controls in place. And the Center for Internet Security also has the critical security controls, uh, which you can go through to see are they in place and which ones will be uh, appropriate for your business to ensure compliance with GTPR. I do think one of the biggest bang for bucks many companies can get when it comes to data protection and uh, ensuring uh, information is properly protected is having very effective security awareness training, making sure the right messages get out to staff as to how they should uh, deal with personal information, how they should handle it, how they should protect it, and how they should communicate it to other parties. So security awareness training is an essential element in, in ensuring you have an effective data protection regime within your organization. I think it's important as well as that it, making sure you put all the controls in place, be they technical controls, people controls, or process controls, that's quite important to monitor all those controls to ensure that A, they are effective and they're working as they should be. And more importantly, that if there is a breach, that you can identify that breach and respond to that breach quickly and effectively as well. Uh, we've all heard about major security breaches that companies haven't identified for, for months, uh, but I think it's important that you put in the right processes and procedures yourself and, and tools to ensure that you can identify a, a data breach and respond to it quickly. Remember, once you detect it, you've only got 72 hours to, to report it to your supervisory authority. So hopefully that, that, that has given you some background on what GDPR is and given you some ideas on how you can ensure that you're compliant with it. Uh, I know May 25th, 2018 may sound like a long way away, that it's quite a number of months away and there's probably other pressing projects on at the moment, but it is important to start preparing, planning and getting ready for GTPR. So if, you, if, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna ask me when should you start getting ready for it, start now. So, so start your project as soon as you can to ensure that you are compliant with GTPR. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention, and I hope you found the presentation useful, and uh, quite happy to take any questions anybody may have. Uh, and if you don't get to your questions in uh, during this session, my details are there on Twitter and the email if you want to follow up with me. So uh, thank you very much. First of all, uh, thank you, Brian, for a, a really interesting and informative presentation. Uh, we're now going to do a, a little bit of a, a Q&A session um, so I've got some questions to, to ask you, and uh, hopefully they're, they're both interesting for our audience and, and interesting for you to answer as well. Um, uh, the first is okay. uh, really about the audit process. Um, you know, uh, can we get a little more bit detail on how uh, auditing for the GDPR will work? Um, what, what will the process be for organizations that have to be compliant? Well, as you said, Tim, all, all organizations have to be compliant with GDPR. So uh, the audit process would in a lot of cases be self-regulation that they'd have to ensure that they are compliant themselves. Uh, but will organizations can also be subject to an audit by the supervisory authority. Uh, and that can happen uh, by a number of triggers. It could either be as a result of complaints made to the supervisory authority about the organization, uh, and the complaints may be how the organization is not handling data properly, uh, and that could result in an audit. Uh, it could be as a result of a data breach. So as after a significant breach, the supervisory authority may look to investigate the company to ensure that it is protecting information in, in accordance with the requirements of uh, the GDPR. And then finally, there's the, the, the supervisory authorities have the ability to do spot checks uh, on companies either by in the sector or they could simply pick different companies at, at different stages to, uh, to, to, to run an audit. So there would be the three main uh, times you could expect an audit. Uh, so is it more of an ad hoc process for auditing rather than a, a schedule that um, people can predict and, and plan around? Yeah. Uh, if, if you think about the, the, the complexity of GTBR and the, and the size of companies, it wouldn't be feasible for every supervisory authority to run an annual audit on every company under their uh, uh, their scope. 
so it would be pretty much ad hoc, but I would uh, warn companies or, uh, that they shouldn't take it for granted. They would never get orders because it, it can happen at any time. Uh, so it's always best to be prepared, and it's good business to comply with uh, GDPR and to protect your, your client's information anyway. So I would s- schedule my own internal order function or external order function to ensure that that's what's happening. Good advice. Um, you also mentioned during the, the presentation that the GDPR is is sort of a, the evolution of the EU uh, Data Protection Directive. What are the, the primary differences between the Data Protection Directive and the GDPR? Well, the big uh, differences are if, if you're already compliant with the Data Protection Directive, you are a good way along the journey to be compliant with GDPR because the same principles uh, are there with regards to data protection. Uh, there are some significant differences though that you do need to take into account and you do need to be prepared for. Uh, the first one being uh, there will now be mandatory breach notification. So up until GTPR there, there really hasn't been any mandatory breach notifications within the EU uh, except for some specific industries uh, but that's now going to apply to all organizations that handle personal data and if they suffer security breach they will be required to uh, within 72 hours of identifying the breach inform the, their, their uh, supervisory authority. Uh, with GTPR, there will now also be significant fines for, uh, for breaches of GTPR, uh, and companies need to be aware that can happen, and there could be uh, heavy financial penalties as a result. Um, and those penalties can either be uh, Financial, or they could also be you could, you could be forced to delete data, uh, etc. So uh, you need to be uh, aware uh, of those fines. Uh, companies also need to be uh, cognizant that they could and have to appoint a data protection officer, uh, and that is somebody who is responsible within the organisation for ensuring data protection and the GDPR regulations are adhered to and followed to, and this person must report to a senior management team or, uh, as well and has to be autonomous and independent uh, within the organization. So that's a significant change as well. Uh, now, that doesn't have to be a full-time person. It can be somebody else has this as a role, but it, it is something that companies need to, to uh, uh, take into account. I suppose the, the, the other big change that I would uh, highlight is that if a company is looking to launch new services or uh, new applications that process or store personal information that they need to conduct a privacy impact assessment uh, before that happens to ensure that they have identified any risk to personal information and, and have addressed those risks in the uh, development and delivery of that service too. Hmm. So there are, there are actually quite a few significant changes, and, and complying with the, the Data Protection Directive doesn't doesn't mean you're you're already compliant with GDPR by any means. What about no, it the exception? You haven't got a, you haven't got a green flag to go. You do have to uh, uh, take into account those changes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about exceptions for the the GDPR? So a, a fair amount of of the GDPR is about transparency for personal data, you know, consent and the the right to. Um, you know, uh, have your data erased. Are there exceptions for uh, government data that's been collected or for surveillance or intelligence where, um, you know, consent and uh, uh, the the right to have it erased would, would impact the, the usability of that data? <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the, the, there are exceptions for certain uh, security agencies and government bodies to uh, uh, not have to fully comply with GTPR, but there will be expectations that the principles will be will be there. But uh, it's not; it wouldn't be a case that if you're uh, a criminal that you can re- ring up your local police station and find out all, all the information they have about you and, and get them deleted. So you have a you don't have a criminal record anymore. <laughs> uh, there, or there if, will you're, be if you're under surveillance, you don't get a, a, a informed consent ahead of time. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Please, Mr. Terrorist, we want to tell you that we're going to inform you. No, that 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 won't happen. But any laws to that government member states want to put in place for uh, surveillance or law enforcement will be expected to respect the rights, uh, the privacy rights of the 
innocent people as well. So, uh, it, it, you know, mass surveillance and stuff like that would would not be conducive or in line with GDPR. So governments would be expected to ensure whatever regulations or laws they put in place for surveillance and, and law enforcement uh, work in tandem with GDPR. So while, while we're talking a little bit about the, the consent, how, how far does that definition of, of clear consent go? Is it is it you know just a checkbox that that no one's going to read, or is it something more than that? Well, uh, I think uh, very f- famously, Mika Hippen, uh, the, the the Finnish security researcher, famously once said that um, uh, the biggest lie on the internet is that I have read and, and accept all the terms and conditions. <laughs> uh, but uh, on the GTPR, there is a new phrase, and that is if you're going to gather the information of individuals and use that information, they have to give you explicit consent that you're go- that you can use the information for for, for the, the purposes that are there. So first of all, that means ensuring that when you, people agree to sign up for a service that you explicitly tell them what that service is and what their information will be used for. Uh, and then it, you give them the option to accept or or, or not those, those terms. So, uh, you know, it's not a case that you can pick up somebody's information for, for say, for using for a newsletter and then suddenly that information has been used to uh, send marketing information or event information in, in invites outside of the newsletter uh, to the individual. So just because you pick up some of the information for, for one purpose doesn't mean you've got their consent uh, implicitly or otherwise for, for, to use for other services. So you have to get their explicit consent for that. Mm, that's quite, quite a substantial difference, really. Um, so one last mm-hmm. question uh, as we, we wrap up the Q&A. Uh, you, you've already been you know, deeply involved in, in uh, preparation for, for GDPR. But what are some of the common mistakes that you've seen organizations make with their programs already, even before they have to be compliant? Uh, right now, I think the biggest compl- uh, mistake lots of companies are making is that they're not fully prepared for GDPR yet. They They, they think it's... May 2018 is a long way away. Uh, that it's you know uh, it's it's months away, and we don't have to worry about it. Uh, we get there in time, and come May we can start then looking at GDPR. That is not the case. From May 2018, you have to be compliant and working against GDPR. There would be no grace periods. There'd be no uh, breaking in period. It's from day one uh, of May the 25th. Uh, 2018, you have to be compliant. So it's important that you have all your process in place, that you've got staff aware of what's going on, that you've updated your policies, uh, and that you've given people the appropriate training to make sure that they they, they are aware of it. Uh, and I think the other bigger mistakes we find with a lot of multinational companies is they think, well, because we're not in the EU, uh, this doesn't apply to us. But it does. You are going to process or store the information belonging to any EU citizens, this also applies to you, and you need to make sure that you can uh, uh, be compliant with GDPR as well. All right. Thanks, Brian. That, um, that concludes the, the questions that we had, um, and, uh, and uh, thank you so much for the, the presentation and all the answers. I think it was, was really helpful. No problem, Tim. Thanks for having me on. Of course, we wouldn't be providing this webinar with Brian Honan if we didn't believe that Tripwire could help with GDPR compliance. So I get the pleasure of spending a few minutes talking about how Tripwire products can apply to and help with compliance with GDPR. For those of you who might not be familiar with Tripwire, we've actually been around for a long time. In fact, Tripwire has been helping customers achieve and maintain compliance with a variety of standards for about 20 years. Tripwire can help customers with PCI, NERC-SIP, HIPAA, NIST standards, and a variety of others across verticals and around the world. Tripwire has thousands of successful customer deployments across tens of millions of critical endpoints, high customer satisfaction, and trusted by half of the Fortune 500. Tripwire is really a leader in security compliance and operational excellence. So that's a little bit about Tripwire. Let's talk a bit about how Tripwire can help with GDPR compliance specifically. For GDPR compliance specifically, Brian identified in his presentation five steps that he recommended organizations take to prepare. As a reminder, those steps were identifying key data assets, performing risk assessments, 
establishing policies, security awareness training, and monitoring and responding to incidents within the organization. Now, in terms of enabling security in organizations, there are some common challenges that apply across the board for customers who are complying with GDPR or who are generally trying to comply with uh, data security policy overall. Those challenges are detecting unauthorized changes, assessing configurations against security policies, identifying risks on assets, and dealing with the overload of data that comes from collecting such a, a wide volume of security data across the organization. You can see how those challenges that Tripwire addresses uh, map to the recommendations that Brian had. Uh, there are some things that Tripwire doesn't help with, like security awareness training, so we won't cover those. But for these challenges in particular, we can talk about exactly how Tripwire can help. In terms of detecting unauthorized changes, Tripwire can provide detection and alerts on all the changes against an established baseline, uh, providing the, the what, the who, and the business context for those changes. And that can really help with identifying what's happening in an environment uh, that goes towards monitoring and responding uh, to incidents, whether security incidents or, or non-security incidents that may have an impact on compliance. In terms of assessing configurations against security policies, Tripwire provides an extremely extensive library of security configuration best practices uh, that uh, customers can also customize to their specific needs. Tripwire can then monitor the assets in the environment against those policies, ensuring that uh, configurations stay compliant with the policy in place. In terms of identifying risks on assets, uh, Tripwire can actually start by discovering the assets, which, which goes directly to uh, Brian's recommendation about identifying assets in the environment. Tripwire can also identify vulnerabilities, uh, malicious changes we talked a little bit about, and we can also help automate that workflow for the process of remediation. So that goes towards the identification of key data assets and the risk assessment process. In terms of dealing with security data overload, Tripwire is really focused on automation. Anytime there's manual effort in place by a security team, there's an opportunity for automation, and there's an opportunity generally for Tripwire to help with that automation. Focused on change, Tripwire can really integrate with the change management process in an environment, which allows us to reduce the amount of unauthorized change and lets customers focus on the changes that matter, whether they may be changes outside of a, an authorization, uh, changes outside of a change window, or malicious changes that have been made by uh, an attacker. So Tripwire can help across the board in terms of enabling security, and that really goes towards some of the requirements from GDPR uh, around securing the environment and securing the, the customer data. Of course, while security is really the content of the GDPR requirements that we're talking about, the requirement is really compliance. So there's no such thing as compliance without audit. And implementing the security requirements doesn't necessarily make you compliant unless you actually achieve and maintain that compliance against those requirements. So Tripwire not only helps with securing the environment, we also help with the compliance aspect of securing that environment. Uh, we can help by demonstrating compliance against the standards, GDPR included, uh, focus on reducing the time spent on compliance. Um, if you think about compliance or demonstrating compliance as overhead, it's something that you want to reduce and streamline as much as possible. Uh, producing data for audits and forensics is a, a core component of, of what we do as well. Uh, and then maintaining compliance over time, which is especially important for GDPR, and I'll explain that in just a moment. In terms of demonstrating compliance with standards, I did mention that Tripwire has an extremely extensive library of uh, compliance standards, but of course that library includes compliance uh, policy tests for all of those major standards. So whether you select one of the standards that Brian mentioned in, in his presentation or uh, a custom standard, uh, Tripwire generally has you covered in terms of providing policies that you can use in the product to measure compliance against those standards from PCI, NIST, and CIS, and, and many others. Uh, time spent on compliance is always a challenge. Uh, by providing out-of-the-box audit report templates and automated compliance reporting, Tripwire can really help streamline that process of uh, of undergoing an audit of demonstrating compliance. Tripwire also provides uh, extensive logging and log management, which can be valuable for producing data not only for forensics in the case of, of an incident, but also for audits. So while you may provide uh, specific audit reports, if an auditor has a question about a particular moment in time, or what changed between two moments of time, or what happened on a, a particular asset, 
uh, in the past. Uh, the data that Tripwire has collected across our products can really help demonstrate and uh, provide a streamlined process for demonstrating to the auditor that you're maintaining compliance. One of the key components of GDPR has been the uh, the ad hoc audit process, which I had asked Brian about. So rather than having scheduled audits, an audit with GDPR may occur at any point in time. And that makes it incredibly important to approach compliance from a continuous standpoint rather than a point in time audit perspective. Maintaining compliance over time with continuous monitoring and a change based approach really gives customers an advantage in that type of environment. Instead of having to work hard to get compliant before an audit, you maintain compliance continuously, which reduces the overall effort and ensures that when an audit does occur, you're as compliant as possible at the time of the audit. And that's really a significant advantage with GDPR. The story of Tripwire's capabilities really begins with file integrity monitoring. Tripwire's original product offering was focused on file integrity monitoring, and there, there are many customers who start with Tripwire around this topic. But file integrity monitoring at Tripwire has really expanded into general integrity monitoring, focusing on systems and databases and the integrity of customer assets overall. That integrity monitoring approach focused on change in the environment then expanded to include more comprehensive configuration and compliance management. Uh, this is the point in time where Tripwire added policy management uh, and a focus on secure configurations in addition to integrity. Tripwire also has some automated remediation capabilities that may be worth exploring for um, specific customers who are interested in that type of, of response in their environment. From there, Tripwire has expanded to a suite of foundational controls, adding first log management capabilities, uh, where we're focused on secure, reliable log collection, uh, flexible log storage and retention, as well as correlation and log forwarding, allowing customers to build a log collection infrastructure that feeds multiple analytic systems. And then following that up with the addition of vulnerability management, where Tripwire really excels at risk scoring and prioritization, helping customers reduce the noise from the thousands of vulnerabilities that might be discovered in their environment to focus on those that really present the most risk uh, and remediate the highest risk vulnerabilities first. The vulnerability management program also provides asset inventory and profiling of assets, helping to fulfill requirements around understanding what's in the environment so that you can apply the appropriate controls uh, to all of the assets across your environment. Those core controls that Tripwire provides, those foundational controls, have applicability across a variety of functions within a, a customer environment, um, including network security, uh, IT service management, uh, integration with threat intelligence, and certainly integration and data contribution to analytics and uh, security incident and event management programs. Now, Tripwire delivers these capabilities with a set of products. So Tripwire IP360 delivers our vulnerability management. Uh, Tripwire Enterprise and Configuration Compliance Manager deliver the integrity monitoring and configuration compliance. And Tripwire Log Center delivers on our centralized log management capabilities. So with those capabilities, Tripwire has applicability across a variety of standards. We can't list all of the possible standards with which Tripwire can help on a single slide, but these are really the most popular across the customer environment and organizations where Tripwire is applicable. Whether it's CIS or NIST cybersecurity framework or ISO 27001, all of these standards have a fairly common set of foundational controls that are required, things like configuration compliance, integrity monitoring, vulnerability management, log management. Tripwire's core set of foundational controls is applicable across the standards. And because GDPR allows for some flexibility in choosing a standard, that commonality of foundational controls is really one of the areas where Tripwire can be most effective at achieving and maintaining compliance with GDPR. Let's look at a couple of specific examples. One of the most popular frameworks for which we see adoption is the critical security controls from the Center for Internet Security. There are 20 critical security controls, and Tripwire can help with the first four completely and then with a variety of capabilities across uh, the remaining. The first four encompass inventory of authorized and unauthorized devices and software, 
secure configurations for hardware and software, and continuous vulnerability assessment and remediation. And you can see how those first four controls map to Tripwire products. Uh, Tripwire IP360 provides for scanning uh, and asset discovery. Tripwire Enterprise provides for business context around authorized and unauthorized devices, and that covers the, the first two. Secure configurations for hardware and software is a core capability for Tripwire Enterprise. And continuous vulnerability assessment and remediation applies directly to Tripwire IP360. CSC number six is about maintenance, monitoring, and analysis of audit logs for which Tripwire Log Center provides the capabilities. And then across the remaining controls, our products provide a, a variety of capabilities that apply. So Tripwire is in a great position to help any customers who are looking at a project around the critical security controls. Another example is the NIST cybersecurity framework, where Tripwire can help not only by providing controls that are actually required within the cybersecurity framework, but also by providing the ability to assess compliance with the framework itself. So where Tripwire Log Center and IP360 might provide capabilities like vulnerability assessment and centralized log management, Tripwire Enterprise, through its policy compliance, can also be used to identify assets in the environment and assess them for compliance with the controls that should be put in place. So Tripwire can provide both foundational controls uh, as implemented and also the ability to measure and monitor compliance against a standard like the NIST cybersecurity framework. And those are really just two more specific examples of the, the variety of frameworks that Tripwire can help achieve and maintain compliance with. For GDPR specifically, there are a number of the articles that have some applicability for uh, the Tripwire product suite. Uh, more data than, than we could present in this particular time frame, but if you're interested in learning more about how Tripwire can help with GDPR, feel free to reach out to us. We're always happy to talk about achieving and maintaining compliance. And with that, I'd like to thank Brian for his time and effort in preparing that presentation on GDPR. I, I think it was informative and useful for all involved. If you'd like to keep in touch with Brian or myself, um, we're both active on Twitter, so feel free to, to follow us there. And if you'd like to learn more about Tripwire and how we can help with compliance, security, and IT operations, feel free to browse over to the Tripwire website at www.tripwire.com or follow Tripwire on Twitter as well. Thank you very much for your time. We appreciate you spending it with us.